Professor Mark Bowles, and I want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about historiography and literature reviews. Historiography is vital to the work of historians, but despite the significance of this practice, many students are often confused by what the term historiography actually means. So what is historiography? What is this uh, mysterious word? Well, to be quite honest, when I first took a historiography graduate level class back in the dark ages of 1993, I literally walked into the classroom and I had no idea what we were going to be covering. Certainly, since that time, I've come to understand it a bit better, and so I want to share some of that insight with you in terms of historiography and also its significance for the literature review itself. But let's start with a bit of imaginary dialogue that I actually have with my students quite often. A student says, I want to write about the Cold War. And I say, great, but I don't care about the history of the Cold War in this class. And then another rather dismayed student says, but I thought you were a history professor. And I respond by saying, Indeed I am, but in this class we are all historiographers. And then the collective frustration from my students sets in, and I hear things like, what does that mean? To answer that question, let's bring in some help from two eminent historians. The first comes from Alice Kessler Harris, who is professor of American history at Columbia University. You can see her picture on the screen now, as well as some of her many notable books. Regarding historiography, she said the following in the OAH, the Organization of American Historians Outlook, in 2011. She said, quote, Over the past two decades or so, we have come to understand that the worldview of a historian necessarily emanates from the world in which he or she lives, and that our views of the past may well be conditioned by our relationships to the present. If all history is present history, as R.G. Collingwood famously put it, then the past is a moving spectacle. This is a critical point, and let's reflect on it for a moment. The past is a moving spectacle. What does that mean? Well, it means that despite what we might think, the past is not fixed it changes over time. Each time, a new historian, who is shaped by the context and time in which he or she lives, has looked at it. If the past were not a moving spectacle, then we could write one book on the Civil War and then say that the definitive history has been written and it's time to look at a different subject. But this, I assure you, is not the case. Historians in past generations have interpreted the Civil War differently from historians today. And that difference, that change over time, that moving spectacle, is the focus of historiography. And this leads to the second historian I'm calling on to assist us, John Gaddis, a professor of military and naval history at Yale University. In his book, The Landscape of History, How Historians Meet the Past, he said the following, Quote, when you study historiography, you do not study the events of the past directly, but the changing interpretations of those events in the works of individual historians. End quote. And these changing interpretations are the moving spectacles that Dr. Alice Harris was talking about. And so a historiographer is looking at these changing interpretations and not the events of the past. So what does this mean for you specifically? Well, it means everything. When will you use historiographical analysis? Well, first, you will certainly use it in a class in historiography. Secondly, you will use it in a literature review for a traditional historical paper. Third, you will use it as a way to contextualize your argument in an MA thesis project. And finally, you will simply use historiography any time you want to better understand the past. If you're writing an MA thesis, 
the literature review is an essential component of your argument, and that is pure historiography. So, to better understand this, let's return to our Cold War example. As I indicated in the imaginary dialogue from before, if you're interested in the Cold War in a historiography class, you're not going to be writing about the history of the Cold War or the events that transpired during the conflict. Instead, you're going to research what historians have written about it over time and how those interpretations have changed. And that means identifying, when you can, schools of thought about the Cold War. Let me give you a very simplistic example to demonstrate. We call the first historians to analyze the Cold War the traditional or orthodox scholars. An example is Herbert Feist and his book Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, published in 1957 by Princeton University Press. His argument was in line with orthodox scholars, and it was that the Soviet Union was to blame for the onset of the Cold War. Another example is historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who said that the Cold War was the, quote, brave and essential response of free men to a communist aggression, end quote. Then in the 1960s, a new school of thought known as Cold War Revisionism emerged. There were a variety of different approaches here, but most stemmed from the 1959 publication of William Appleman Williams's book, The Tragedy of American Diplomacy. Williams was a preeminent historian of American diplomacy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in this interpretation, the American hegemonic empire was more to blame for the Cold War than the Soviet Union. And so you see the pendulum has swung completely in the opposite direction from the traditional or orthodox historians. Starting in the 1970s, though, historians became dissatisfied with both the orthodox and the revisionist accounts of the Cold War. And a new school of thought known as post-revisionism emerged. The leader of the post-revisionists was a historian that I've already mentioned, John Gaddis. And in his 1972 book, The United States and the Origins of the Cold War, he argued that the question of blame could not be assigned to either the United States or the Soviet Union. And in fact, each was responsible for the Cold War in different ways. I'm proud to say that my own work is making a contribution here in 21st century Cold War discussions. In 2008, Cyrus Modi collected five important new books on the Cold War and reviewed them in the journal called Historical Studies in the Natural Sciences. He said that these were notable because they represented scholarship that focused on the otherness and the grandiose Cold War plans which characterized this era. My book, Science in Flux, is one of those that Dr. Modi selected. One of the examples in my book was the billion dollars that the United States spent through NASA's predecessor, the NACA, to build a nuclear airplane. It never flew, and of course the idea of what is essentially a piloted nuclear bomb flying over friendly United States cities was not, in hindsight, the best of ideas. But this is an example of the otherness of the Cold War, the grandiose plans that 21st century Cold War scholars like myself are exploring. And we're not all that concerned about placing blame for the Cold War itself. OK, to recap here, if you want to write a historiography of the Cold War, do not write about the events of the ideological conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Instead, here is a chart that addresses how you would put together an outline to make a historiographical argument. And again, I'm simplifying here for brevity and clarity. So we start with Herbert Weiss, and you have the orthodox or the traditionalist scholars in the 1950s. The central theme here is that the USA is a hero and the USSR is a villain. Then in the 1960s, you have the revisionists with William Appleman Williams, 
the central theme here is just the opposite. The USA is the villain and the USSR is the hero. Then with John Gaddis, you have the post-revisionists in the 1970s. And the central message here is there are no heroes, there are no villains, everyone was responsible for the Cold War. Then finally, with 21st century scholars, historians are saying, let's look at broader cultural trends and forget the entire issue of blame completely. So in conclusion, I want to say something about a literature review. Historiography is not just for a class that you take in historiography. As a historian, the ultimate goal is to develop an original argument about the past. The way this is initially proved is through a literature review. And this is where you place your analysis into a historiographical context. This might be done in a shorter end of course research paper in a graduate seminar, um, or it's a vital component for a master's thesis at the end of your studies. So consider my example with the book Science and Flux earlier. One way for me as an author to establish the significance of my analysis, the cultural and technological approach to understanding the Cold War, was by situating it within the ongoing scholarly debate between the traditionalists, the revisionists, the post-revisionists, and today the 21st century scholars of the Cold War. So ultimately, the goal towards which you should strive as a historian is to focus on the historiography of your argument because this is a vital, essential, and a never-ending component to your studies in history. I'm going to leave you with the insight from Professors Kessler-Harris and Gaddis from earlier. I invite you to pause the video, read, and reflect on the wisdom here. This is historiography, and it is vital to our profession. And hopefully it answers what the question was on the opening blackboard slide of this lecture. What is historiography, and why should I care? Well, hopefully you get a sense now of why it is vital for you to care and to practice your historiographical skills. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you have a better sense now of the distinction between history and historiography and why the difference matters.